Jordanian desert, an incredible ancient treasure still stands, the monumental city of Petra. Built over 2,000 years ago by the ancient Nabataean civilization, Petra's construction is colossal, with monuments, tombs, and temples carved into the sides of cliffs. The nature of Petra as a rock-carved city is really unique. There are not other places with this many tombs and this kind of architecture. To sustain this ancient desert city, its engineers built a water supply system with channels and pipelines that transformed Petra into a desert oasis. Filled with lush gardens, a pool, and a thermal spa. You just didn't have water that was available during seasons. You had water available all year. Even today, the achievements of Petra's engineers are astounding. They made a region of harsh, arid mountains into a prosperous city of over 20,000 people and an ancient trading capital. Ce qui est fascinant dans l'étude de la culture et du monde nabatéen, c'est qu'en en moins de deux siècles, ils vont créer une cité complètement exceptionnelle, un mélange extrêmement luxueux et complètement exubérant qui fait aujourd'hui cette, cette merveille qui pétra. Now, experts take us behind the scenes to finally see how this ancient culture carved cliffside monuments that still stand today. Discover how this forbidding landscape became the amazing city of Petra. The ancient city of Petra stands a 200 kilometer journey south from Jordan's capital, Amman. Halfway between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea, Petra is strategically located in a valley at the end of a narrow canyon. It's an astounding sight, with monuments carved into the rock face on all sides. Built over 2,000 years ago, the ancient people who constructed the city were known as the Nabataeans. But why did these nomadic merchants build their city in a remote desert canyon? Petra was the perfect crossroads. It was a nexus of commerce. So you have north-south trade that involved frankincense and myrrh, and then turquoise and peridot and gemstones coming from the south. Then you have the east-west trade coming through, which is now Kuwait, that would have brought silk and Chinese goods in from the east. So there's no coincidence that Petra was the perfect location to build a city, and a city that would boom within hundreds of years to thousands of inhabitants. In addition to its location at the nexus of valuable trade routes, Petra also had other advantages. Its steep hillsides provided a natural defense against invaders. The city's builders constructed control towers at its highest points to secure the area. The entry point for the city passed through a narrow gorge formed by erosion called the Seek. Petra stood at the junction of multiple dry stream valleys, called wadis, which the Nabataeans used to direct rainflow and spring water to the city. You're in a desert, water is scarce, and what do you find is a large basin where water drains from a couple of directions. So the original 
inhabitants of Petra understood that where water converges is probably the most important thing to look for for a desert city. It's not a coincidence. It's not an arbitrary location. It's the perfect location where you have water and then trade, commerce, a flat valley that would be ideal for a city center. Petra is the best location within one or 200 miles easily, if not a thousand miles to build a city. The Nabataeans built their hidden city in just 200 years. The entry point through the Sikh led to a vast plain that became the city center home to 20 to 30,000 people in the first century AD. Nearly 3,000 monuments and buildings decorated the city and its surrounding cliffsides. The six square kilometer city became the capital of the Nabataean kingdom. These master architects built the lavish Kazne or treasury near the entrance to the city. The structure is decorated with details that show the influence of Greek and Egyptian architecture. High columns are topped with ornate Corinthian capitals. At the entrance is flanked by statues of the Greek mythological figures Castor and Pollux. The second level features a tholos, a circular Greek structure surrounded by sculptures of Egyptian and Greek deities worn down by 2,000 years of erosion. At the top, a massive urn stands 3.5 meters high. Inside lies a vast hall opening onto three large rooms. But unlike the exterior, the inside of the structure is plain, with the walls left completely bare. The function of the Kazne remains uh, a puzzling question, and it has been speculated that it was a tomb for one of the Nabataean kings. Possibly, it was a tomb for the great Nabataean king, Aratus IV, but this is only guesswork. Uh, we really don't know who was buried there, and there are no inscriptions at any of the tombs to give us some idea of who this tomb represents. The Kazne was carved out of a sandstone cliff that stands 80 meters high. For workers to carve out this massive structure, Petra's architects had to rethink their usual building methods. A typical bottom to top plan would be impossible when carving from a cliff. Si on commence dans le bas, on ne sait pas le point exact où il faudrait commencer pour être à l'aplomb du sommet, puisque les falaises ne sont pas toujours verticales, elles peuvent être légèrement en pente, c'est très difficile à calculer. Et puis surtout, le problème, c'est qu'il faut détailler constamment au-dessus de sa tête, euh, avec tout, tous les problèmes que cela pose, c'est-à-dire euh, les retombées sur, euh, sur les ouvriers. So they carved the Kazne from top to bottom. But the structure's sides soar nearly 40 meters high. How did the workers get to the top to even start carving? Scaffolding makes sense, but in the desert, wood was scarce. If we look at the pollen record in Petra, we notice that trees were not much more abundant than they are today. And the trees that did exist in the area are similar to trees we see today, juniper and oak. The climate hasn't changed enough to change 
the variety of trees. So trees did grow then, but they grew sparsely. They were not common at all. So the use of scaffolding would have been a, a very, very rare luxury for the Nabataeans to have. Without wood to build scaffolding, Petra's architects got creative, and their methods are still visible on the mountain today. لما فكروا الأنباط بأنهم بدون يعملوا الواجهة الخزنة قبل هذا الكلام جهزوا المكان اللي بيقدروا يوصلوا فيه لقمة الجبل عشان يبدأوا القطع من الأعلى إلى الأسفل طبعا بنوا هذا الدرج وخلوه عريض بالحجم هذا علشان العمال يقدروا يطلعوا وينزلوا بسهولة وهم معاهم الأدوات اللي كانوا يستخدموها في عملية الحفر هان كان في جسر اللي كانوا يقدروا يطلعوا من الجهة على الجهة الثانية وبعدها يصير عملية التفاف من وراء الجبل ويطلعوا على راس الجبل وبلشوا عملية الحفر في الخزنة. After climbing the first part of the staircase, visitors reach a huge cave, a shelter carved out by workers at the start of construction. احنا هنا يعني في 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 هذه الجزئية اللي كانت وظيفتها فقط خدمة العاملين في واجهة الخزنة. العمال يتجمعوا هان وينطلقوا من هان على الجسر اللي أعدوه مسبقا من مشان يطلعوا من هان على الجهة الثانية ولفوا من وراء الجبل. Even the preparation for the monument was impressive. But it was all to set the stage for the construction to come. Experts say the ancient architects used certain methods to carve the Cosne straight out of the rock. The first step was to carve a ledge in the cliffside. Then, the workers could use the ledge to access the face of the rock and began carving the gigantic urn at the top. Next, they dug two vertical trenches on either side. Then the ledge was carved further, and another section of the Cosne began to take shape. A series of indentations likely served as ladders, so workers could reach the different levels of the structure. They continued this process until they finally reached the bottom. There was no room for mistakes. Once they completed a level, they couldn't reach it again later. The smallest mistake would stay carved into the rock for thousands of years. The remnants of the vertical trenches and enclaves are still visible today. Reminders of this massive undertaking by Petra's ancient architects Experts believe the builders finished the job in less than four years. Two kilometers from here, another one of the city's monuments was also carved entirely from the rock. It's called Ad Deir. It's not an easy place to reach. Through a narrow path and up over 800 stone steps, the colossal structure towers over the city below. The exterior of Ad Deir is less ornate and more abstract than the Cosne's figurative decoration. But both structures feature imposing columns supporting two levels of pediments and a tholos. Ad Deir also features a 10 meter high urn at the top of its tholos. During the Christian period, it was developed into a monastery. But in the earlier period, its purpose seems to have been originally a tomb. Uh, who was buried there and when is a matter of speculation again. But it is uh, one of the most uh, magnificent tombs at Petra along with the Cosne. At first, it seems Ad Deir was built the same way as the Cosne, 
since both monuments were carved entirely from the rock. But the cliffs are less steep than the Cosne. The sides of the rock around Ad Deir slope more gently toward the ground, so workers could use different methods to carve this structure. Getting started was also relatively easier. Workers could climb the slope to the top, making the carving of the urn a much simpler task. Building the rest of the structure took two stages. The first was to create a giant set of steps across the face of the rock, eliminating the excess rock so the vertical facade could take shape. Then, workers carved Ad Deir step by step from top to bottom. To the untrained eye, the sculpture work on Ad Deir may seem almost crude. The columns and their capitals are simple and abstract, and the pediments are sparely decorated. But the structure's simplicity belies a superior level of mastery. Contrairement à ce que beaucoup de personnes croient, il est plus facile de réaliser un chapiteau, par exemple, avec des feuilles d'acanthe, un chapiteau richement orné, parce qu'on peut toujours se débrouiller si on a commis une petite erreur dans le tracé de modifier légèrement la forme de la feuille euh, de manière à cacher son erreur et personne ne le verra. En revanche, avec des lignes pures, euh, la moindre erreur est visible donc euh, il faut être beaucoup plus soigneux et attentif et rigoureux donc euh, on peut on n'a pas le droit à l'erreur. Odier's smooth columns and refined lines are the result of incredible skill. Even more impressive, they were all carved out of the mountain in one piece. When a structure is made of stone blocks assembled together, carvers can choose them individually before beginning their work. Not possible here. The sculptors worked up against the rocky wall, digging centimeter by centimeter. Every step had to be perfect. Si euh, l'on casse par erreur ou parce qu'il y a un petit problème dans la roche, qu'on casse un élément euh, de corniche, de chapiteau, etc., eh bien, euh, à ce moment-là, euh, on ne peut pas remplacer le bloc. La moindre erreur, euh, eh bien, c'est fatal, on ne, on ne peut pas la réparer. The lost city of Petra is home to over 2,700 monuments and structures carved from the rock. Millions of years of erosion shaped the landscape before it was sculpted by human tools, revealing the many layers of sandstone in all their colors. The nature of Petra as a rock-carved city is really unique. Uh, there are not other places with this many tombs and this kind of architecture. The number of these rock-carved uh, areas is um, unparalleled anywhere in the Mediterranean world. Petra is, is uh, unique, uh, exceptional in this regard. In addition to the rock-carved monuments, the city also housed many more stone structures built using traditional construction methods. The sandstone used to build the freestanding structures came from nearby construction sites. When carving their cliffside monuments, workers shaped and reused the large amounts of stone removed from the mountains. Many of the more traditional buildings have been destroyed or buried in the sand after 2,000 years. The number of buildings Petra once contained remains unknown, 
but experts say there were more than just the leftover stone extracted from cliffside constructions. The builders also drew from sources outside Petra. Archaeological excavations have found 14 stone quarries around the city, where workers extracted thousands of cubic meters of multicolored sandstone. Southeast of the city, at the summit of Jebel al-Madba, lies one of the biggest stone quarries. The extraction of huge stone blocks, weighing hundreds of kilos, would have taken years. The workers' only tools were a pick, a mallet, and an iron wedge. Two stone obelisks, each almost seven meters high, are all that remain to show the rock's original height. These columns left behind are signs and witness uh, about the uh, volume of the rock that were extracted from this particular quarry, which counts for at least tens of thousands of cubic meters. Petra's most impressive stone quarry is at Wadi Asiak. Here, workers dug out the floor to extract almost 30 meters of rock. But at the bottom, they discovered sandstone of much higher quality. So they dug further, directly into the bottom of the cliff, carving out an opening over eight meters long. This kind of uh, sand is quite hard. So it is uh, more resistance uh, than the others. It is characterized by its yellowish brownish uh, color. So um, there are a huge amount of uh, rocks were excavated from this uh, quarry. It is estimated that the quantities of the rock which is extracted from this quarry alone more than 31,000 meter cube. Even after removing the blocks of sandstone from the mountain, the workers still had to move them to the city. How they did that remains a mystery. Il est plutôt rare de retrouver les traces laissées par d'éventuels transports de pierre. Il faut tenir compte du fait que les carrières ont été ici exposées euh, aux intempéries pendant 2000 ans et que bien entendu cette pierre subit des érosions assez importantes et donc les traces de ces éventuels déplacements de blocs ont totalement disparu ou ont été occultées par euh, des constructions postérieures ou des remblais, des déblais, etc. Donc la vie, 2000 ans de vie. That hasn't stopped archaeologists from offering theories based on local topography. The quarries are all found above the valley. They're not at the lower portion of the valley. So the quarries where the rock was removed to use for construction in Petra are all found either at the same level or above. So simple roller tools could have been used to haul the rock down. The workers probably used simple wooden rollers to move the stone. Logs would have been placed on top of two larger parallel tree trunks. The stone blocks could then be rolled down the slope to the city. One of the most impressive monuments built using sandstone blocks mined from the quarries is the Great Temple. The enormous building stretches to 7,000 square meters. Despite its name, it was probably not used as a temple, but as a central administrative building or as the public section of the royal palace. The massive entrance porch leads to a series of rooms and hallways surrounded by columns. Was this a courtroom or an assembly area? 
Its intended purpose has been lost to time. Now, only ruins remain of this once imposing building. But its massive stone blocks raise another archaeological mystery. How did the builders raise these stones 35 meters into the air without scaffolding? Petra's architects left no written record, but the methods used by the Romans and other civilizations provide a few theories. Il existe un certain nombre de machines qui sont réalisées en bois qui permettent de lever les pierres. Et la majorité des machines qui sont utilisées, ce sont des chèvres, c'est-à-dire ce sont deux poutres qui sont assemblées, qui tiennent grâce à des hauts bancs et avec une poulie, on lève la pierre et on la, avec un mouvement de balancier, on l'approche du mur, tout simplement. Another type of lifting device is called a derrick. Made up of a single large wooden beam, it is placed in a hole in the ground to anchor it. On the other end, pulleys are connected to two cords attached to the ground and a third cord tied around the rock. Using a pendulum-like movement, the rock can be lifted and positioned anywhere in the construction site. Les mâts de charge sont certainement les plus pratiques que des chèvres. La chèvre ne se déplace que dans un sens, elle ne tourne pas. Alors que le mât de charge, on peut prendre un bloc d'un côté, tourner et le déposer sur le monument. Donc, personnellement, je pense plutôt au mât de charge. Using these ancient tools, the builders probably spent years constructing the great temple. Some estimate that all of Petra must have taken at least 200 years to build. On top of everything else, ancient Nabataean architects faced one more natural obstacle around Petra. A 1,200-kilometer fault line marks where two tectonic plates meet, the Arabian plate and the Sinai subplate. The seismic risk is very high along this fault line. Several earthquakes have struck Petra through the years, leading to the destruction of structures not built into the surrounding cliff sides, except for one, Khazar al-Bent. In Bedouin Arabic, the name means the palace of the Pharaoh's daughter, but it was also thought to be the city's largest place of worship. معبد قصر البنت هو واحد من ثلاث معابد في وسط مدينة البتراء تمثل المجمع الديني هذا المعبد تم إنشاءه في النصف الثاني من القرن الأول قبل الميلاد وتم التطوير على عملية الإنشاء واستمر حتى النصف الأول من القرن الميلادي في عهد الملك حارث الرابع تم إنشاء هذا المعبد لتعظيم ولتقديس الإله ذو الشرى كبير الآلهة في في فترة العرب الأنباط في البتراء. This temple was no ordinary construction. It was built to withstand nature itself. The temple of Khazar al Bent is a perfect square. So in an earthquake, pressure hits evenly across all four sides of the monument reducing the overall impact. To further protect their place of worship, the Nabataean builders also used another strategy, traces of which are still visible on the temple walls. These horizontal grooves are actually the remains of ancient wooden beams. When building the temple's load-bearing walls, the architects added cedar beams at various levels. Connecting to each other, the beams served as reinforcement throughout the structure. Since wood is more flexible than stone, the beams could help absorb part of the pressure of an earthquake. The 
بتهز الارضيه لما بتيجي من الاسفل وبترتفع لاعلى لما بتصدر في لوح الخشب بتتشتت حتى لو استمرت برضه في خشب موجود بين الواجهات عشان يضعف الهزه الارضيه ويكون تاثيرها على الجزء العلوي الاقل ولذلك هاي التقنيه ساعدت في بقاء هذا المعبد رغم ضخامته ورغم عظمه انشائه هو المبنى الوحيد اللي استخدمت فيه هذه التقنيه والمبنى الوحيد اللي ما زال صامد رغم تعرض المنطقه لعده هزات ارضيه These unusual techniques allowed Khazar al-Bint to remain standing for 2,000 years in the heart of the ancient city. Earthquakes weren't the only challenge Petra's builders faced. To survive, the desert city also needed to carefully manage its water supply. The average rainfall is about 15 centimeters a year here. When the rain finally falls between December and March, it can lead to devastating flash floods. The city's architects had to capture any rainfall they could so they could supply the population with water throughout the year, while also protecting themselves from flash flooding. The walls of the Sikh, the narrow gorge marking the entrance to Petra, hold clues to how the ancient builders controlled the flow of water. This carving channel came all the way from the entrance of the sea till the treasury facade, which is about 1,200 meters. The sea is marked by channels in the cliff sides and more sophisticated systems. Clay pipes actually built into the cliffs, assembled in sections connected by waterproof coating. Their diameter allowed for natural pressure within the pipes. This meant the water could naturally flow toward the city center unobstructed and even go up gentle slopes. Further north of the city, Another site reveals the complexity of this ancient city's infrastructure. These were once Petra's water purification reservoirs. If you look to the edge of the cliff, you can see a carving channel, which is mostly destroyed. The idea of this channel is to collect water from the top of the cliff, and then firstly feed that big basin here, which we can call it as a collection uh, basin and uh, the main using for this basin is to uh, let silt settle down for a while and in this case they can be sure the water is getting somehow filtered and out of dirt and after that when they sure that some of the water getting filtered and it's good through a small valve in this wall between the two basin the water go to this next uh, small basin and kept for the next step, which is going again through this dam here and another small valve in the dam, and then through more cistern, water channels and pipes to feed the rest of many uh, water cistern in this area. Passing through multiple basins, the water would settle little by little losing its impurities. The final reservoir held clean drinking water, which would then be piped into the city's water system. Years of archaeological excavations have found that Petra's water system was tremendously complex. The city was surrounded by dams and a network of reservoirs for storage and purification, along with long diversion canals all helping to avoid flooding while also storing the city's precious rainwater supply. The city center contained dozens of kilometers of canals. Water was routed along the cliff sides, passed through the streets and aqueducts, flowed over walls and fed into the city's many cisterns and reservoirs. 
if we connect actually all the pipes together, we can reach something like 170 kilometer of pipes in one line. So this is give us an uh, idea of how much work done to protect the site and the region. Once they learned how to engineer that water for storage and built cisterns and storage facilities and reservoirs, suddenly you just didn't have water that was available during seasons. You had water available all year. Petra's mastery of water made it a genuine desert oasis in just a few decades. Next to the great temple in the city center, the Nabataeans even built a large, luxurious bathing complex using thousands of liters of water. The complex was fronted by a lush garden with numerous trees, leading to a basin as large as an Olympic-sized swimming pool. In the middle stood a richly decorated pavilion. Thousands of years later, the site lies in ruins. When archaeologists first began excavating here decades ago, they never expected to find something so lavish. On voit qu'avant fouille, il n'y a rien de visible. On le voit en face en particulier, ce sont des, des pentes complètement nues. Mais dès qu'on fouille, les vestiges sortent. Et c'est ce qui est arrivé dans ce secteur-ci, où euh, les fouilles ont révélé un système extrêmement complexe de canalisation, d'enduits hydrauliques, de citernes, dans une architecture extrêmement raffinée. Et rapidement, les archéologues ont compris qu'ils avaient affaire à un complexe très monumental, articulant une sorte de piscine à ciel ouvert. Et au centre de cette piscine, un pavillon, euh, extrêmement raffiné, très monumental lui aussi, et en contrebas de cette piscine, un jardin avec des, des éléments d'architecture très raffinés, vraiment une architecture extrêmement fine, et donc une architecture de représentation, et, euh, et l'ensemble complètement monumental était alimenté par une série de citernes et d'aqueducs qui arrivaient de l'ensemble de la vallée. But this wasn't the only luxurious use of water in this 2,000-year-old desert city. Further away, at the top of Jebel Kukta was an even more sophisticated spot, a gigantic thermal spa. Its entrance was through a wide courtyard, which opened onto a banquet room on one side and a frigidarium on the other. The frigidarium held a pool of cold water the first stop for spa visitors. The next room was the tepidarium, a warm water pool. It helped visitors adjust to the following hot rooms. Equipped with group basins large enough for two or three people. The discovery of this thermal spa was a surprise to archaeologists. It was unusual to find such a complex site on the plains overhanging the city center. Petra est un site extrêmement connu, très visité, mais on se rend compte en fait, euh, dès qu'on s'intéresse un peu à la question, qu'énormément de vestiges sont en partie visibles, mais inconnus. Et donc l'idée euh, de départ était de faire une cartographie générale du secteur, de placer sur un plan tous les murs euh, dont on voit apparaître plus ou moins le sommet, et sur la base de ce plan, de tenter une interprétation euh, des vestiges du Djebel Rukhtad. Et notre surprise, ça a été de voir sortir sur le plan un édifice tout à fait caractéristique de l'architecture thermale. Et effectivement, la fouille a confirmé qu'on avait bien affaire, malgré la disposition au sommet d'un plateau, au sommet d'une falaise, euh, qu'on avait bien affaire à un édifice thermal. In the section containing the hot baths, excavations uncovered a complex heating system inspired by the Romans called a hypocaust. A hearth in a ventilated service room served as the main heat source. Small openings connected it to the floors of the spa rooms, funneling hot air and smoke underneath the hot bath in an underground chamber constructed from stacked bricks, allowing heat to freely circulate. The walls also held a network of clay water pipes, which were connected to outlets on the roof of the building.
Other excavations revealed the ruins of nearby buildings, part of a complex that covered the entire plateau. Ici, on a déjà l'aqueduc, l'aqueduc qui alimentait les bains, qui est associé à tout un réseau de captation des eaux de ruissellement. Il y a un arc qui franchissait ici cette vallée pour alimenter le château d'eau des bains. Et ici, de l'autre côté, un ensemble tout à fait intéressant qui est un petit sanctuaire rupestre et auquel on accédait par un escalier qui était ici. The baths of Jebel Kupta drew inspiration from Greco-Roman thermal culture. But this small sanctuary indicates that thermal practice here may not have been simply for leisure, but was likely connected to ritual. In this complex towering over the city, the wealthiest of Petra's inhabitants relaxed in luxurious style while taking in the view of their capital. The Nabataeans overcame nature's obstacles from the unforgiving desert and sheer cliff sides to tectonic instability. In only 200 years, in an inhospitable landscape, this ancient civilization built a luxurious and extraordinary city. Ce qui est fascinant dans l'étude de la culture et du monde nabatéen, c'est de voir comment, en quelques siècles, ces populations vont tout d'un coup gagner énormément d'argent et vouloir obtenir ce qui se fait de mieux dans le monde antique. Et donc importer des artisans, euh, des architectes, des matériaux, des pratiques euh, du monde gréco-romain. Cette façon que les nabatéens vont avoir tout d'un coup de se doter de tout ce qui se fait de mieux euh, fait qu'en en, en moins de deux siècles, ils vont créer une cité complètement exceptionnelle en prenant vraiment euh, des choses de, de Rome, d'Égypte, et en faire un mélange extrêmement luxueux, complètement exubérant, qui fait aujourd'hui cette, cette merveille qui pétera. In 106 AD, the Roman Empire annexed the Nabataean Kingdom. Over time, the city's structures were modified, transformed, or even destroyed by Roman engineers. The city was slowly abandoned, and its location lost to history. It would only be rediscovered in the early 19th century by a Swiss explorer. Ever since then, Petra has captivated its visitors. It's easy for us to think that people in our past were not as clever and knowledgeable um, as we are now. But when we look at the engineering expertise of the Nabataeans then, I really think we're looking at a society, a community of, of amazing engineering skills. They knew how to use the rock to their advantage for storage, for decoration, they knew how to use a landscape covered with a beautiful soil that would have been ideal for agriculture. And they knew that water was the key and the source to their livelihood. We don't have any parallel for the Nabataeans and their architecture elsewhere. So it is fairly unique. Their engineering skill, their artistic skill, their architectural skill, all of these are very impressive. 2,000 years later, mysteries still remain at Petra. Archaeologists, historians, and geologists continue to study the city's incredible structures. Petra endures as an unparalleled monument to the architectural mastery of its ancient builders.